Well, good morning, everyone. If you could take your seats, that'd be great. We are continuing in our series. In fact, I'll be concluding our series on the return of the king. Some of you remember back in about 1976, Andre Crouch wrote a song that goes like this. Soon and very soon We are going to see the king Soon and very soon We are going to see the king Soon and very soon We are going to see the king Hallelujah, hallelujah We're going to see the king There'll be no dying there. We are going to see the king. Be no dying there. We are going to see the king. Be no dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know Jesus is coming. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. How many of you know that's great encouragement? Our trouble is that we forget this or we don't keep it in our minds and it just, we just lose sight of that. And if you don't think or you don't realize or it's not preeminent in your thinking that that the king is coming back, then it changes how you your perspective on everything. If if you believe that this life is all there is and the way things are, how many of you know this world's pretty messed up? And it doesn't seem to be getting much better, does it? A lot of people seem to think that if we you know, if, if we just try this political party or that political candidate or if we vote for this guy or that guy or somebody else, maybe it'll all get better. Got news for you. It's not getting much better till the king comes. Amen. Now, look, I, I, I believe we need to be active. We, we, we need to be involved. We, you need to pray about it and think about it before, and, and you need to vote. But you know what the difference is between those who know the king is coming and those who have forgotten that is they put way too much emphasis on politics. You need to understand that, that, that look, this, this world is doomed. It's not getting any better. It's like the Titanic. It's already struck the iceberg. It's going down, baby. But thank God the king is coming. And when he comes, he's going to fix all that's wrong. And he's going to bring a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. I'm voting for that guy. I'm waiting for that king. Amen? Amen. And this is what we need to encourage one another with, the fact that the king is coming. We know he's coming, we just don't know when. Now this message this morning is entitled to help us get a handle on what we're supposed to be doing while we're waiting. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians aren't even waiting. They're just almost like not even thinking about it. But we do. We need to be thinking about it and, and preparing for it. And there's something we need to be doing, some things we need to be doing while we're waiting. Now, all authentic Christians believe that Christ is coming. 
Now, there's a lot of different opinions regarding when he's coming and how that will occur and what we're supposed to be doing is a vital concern to us. So if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are what are called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is talking to his disciples while he is sitting on the Mount of Olives and is explaining what will come to pass both in the short term, like for example the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the end of the age. And he begins his discourse with this word of admonition, watch. Everybody say watch. watch. Now the first portion of this passage describes some of the signs of his coming, the end of the age, things that we ought to be looking for, watching for, and we talked about this briefly last week and the week before. The last portion deals with what we ought to be doing while we wait. And it is contained in that word, watch. And basically, I want to talk about what that means. So let's pray. Father, we ask you, first of all, to just encourage our hearts with the fact that the King is coming. We're not down here on our own. We're not slogging it out alone, without hope, without God in the world. But Lord, you are coming. The King is coming. And when you come, Lord, you're going to make right all that's wrong. And Lord, you are going to consummate your kingdom, establish it in the earth, create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Lord, so show us what it is we're supposed to be doing as we wait for the king to come. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 42, let's start there. Jesus says, therefore, keep watch. Now, he's going to repeat this phrase several times in these next two chapters, chapter 24 and 25. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now it's interesting, he uses this imagery of a thief breaking in. It isn't that Jesus is a thief. He's not coming in to steal anything. What he is talking about is that being prepared, being ready. Jesus isn't a thief, but his coming may surprise people. It will surprise people. So he's talking about getting ready, being prepared. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Verse 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So there's a key here, and we're going to unpack this in just a moment. But, supp but suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, Oh, my master is staying away a long time. And he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, how many of you know this? <laughs> we want to avoid that last part. Okay, we, don't want, we don't want that. So what are we to do while we're waiting Christ's return. Well, first of all, we need to watch. We need to watch, Jesus said, because we do not know when Christ will return. Therefore, watch, he said, because you do not know on what day your Lord will, will, will come. Now, there's an acrostic that I learned long ago, 30 years plus ago, which I thought was helpful, which I'll share with you really quickly. What does it mean to watch? Well, what are we to watch? Well, we can watch. Let's see. Can we make it work? Yes. Watch your words. Watch your actions. Watch your thoughts. Watch your companions. Watch your heart. That's all good. Good stuff, right? Joe T., Pastor Joe T., if you know him, he loves this stuff. This is 90% of his sermons are acrostics like this. This is... This is fun. Now, this is all true. This is all good. 
and it's true as far as it goes. But Jesus, through the use of stories and illustrations, tells us, gives us a little bit more clarity as what watch means. Now let me say it this way. Christians have, through the centuries, had some strange ideas regarding the second coming of Christ in the end times. And actually, we have vacillated between two extremes. We have vacillated between one extreme of like just ignoring his coming, living as though he's never coming back, and so we are on our own and we get too bogged down in this world's systems and all of that sort of thing, and we get all worked up about this political thing or that thing or something that's happening, and, it's, and we get too focused on this world that we forget about. We are not watching for his return. That's one extreme. The other extreme is we are overreacting with like fanatical foolishness about the second coming of Christ. For example, in the 1830s, a man named William Miller, who was a Baptist minister from New York, confidently predicted the imminent return of the Lord and set 1942 as the date. Of course, you already know what happens. Nothing. That's what happens. As, 19, as 1842 approached, the enthusiasm of the group rose to a, a nearly fevered pitch. As new converts joined the movement, which began to spread, they passed out tracts. They waited expectantly, but in vain, because, of course, Christ did not return in 1842 or 1843. The Millerites, as they began to be called, they were down, but they were not out. As 1844 dragged on, meetings were rather flat, as you can imagine. And in New Hampshire, on August 12th, one of the brothers stood up and announced the return of the Lord would be on the seventh month of that current year. And it caught on like wildfire, and again, the Millerites are off and running. With fresh enthusiasm, a new date was set and the Millerites went out to warn the world that on October 22nd, the world would end. On a, on a Philadelphia store window, the following sign was displayed, quote, this shop is closed in honor of the King of Kings who will appear about the 20th of October. Get ready, friends, to crown him Lord of all. A group of 200 people left the city as Lot had left Sodom for impending judgment in Genesis 19, most of the Millerites quit their jobs. During the last days, farmers left their crops in the field as they awaited the coming of Christ. But on October 22nd, he didn't come. But hope seems to spring eternal in the Millerite breast. They set yet another date, but that failed too. But five years later, Christ did not come to Miller, but Miller went to Christ. He passed away on December 20th, 1849. And it's interesting, on his tombstone it reads, At the time appointed, the end shall be. <laughs> By the way, the Millerites became the Seventh-day Adventists that are in existence to this day. That's where they, the term Adventist comes from. Now, look, Jesus commanded us to watch because we do not know when he will return. But watch does not mean set dates, quit our jobs, leave the city, wait on a hillside. What does it mean? Well, Jesus gives us some clues in the stories that he tells. So number one, I want to say it this way. To watch is to be faithful. Jesus puts it this way, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So number one, to watch is to be faithful, faithfully giving out the word of God. This is how we are to feed this world. We are to give them the word of God, the word of the Lord. My responsibility as a pastor and a leader is to faithfully teach the word of God 
which is our food at its proper time. But it's not just for me. It's for all of us. It's for, it's, it's for parents to teach your children, to share with them the word of the Lord. It's for Sunday school teachers. It's for Bible study leaders. It's for home group leaders. It's for all of us. We need to be sharing with our neighbors, our friends, the word of God, the, the, the sharing with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. We need to be faithful. If we're going to if we have anything to share with this world, it's the gospel of Jesus. Amen. They don't need to hear about your political party. Right. What they need to hear about is the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Amen? How many of you understand the Republicans aren't going to save us? Right. The Democrats aren't going to save us. Only Jesus is going to save us. He's the only one who can. This is what we need to be sharing with us. We need to be faithful as a witness in the marketplace. Beyond that, it's, it's faithfully loving and serving one another. Jesus said, suppose that wicked servant says to himself, well, my master is staying away a long time and begins to beat his fellow servants. Jesus is saying that because the second coming seems delayed, some people in the church may be tempted to dissolve into fights and quarrels and factions. Oh, that never happens. But Jesus tells us to do this would be wicked. When we fight and attack one another, it is wickedness. To watch means that we need to love and serve one another. Amen? Amen. Thirdly, faithfully walking in holiness and purity. Holiness and purity. He said to eat and drink with drunkards. Some will be tempted to do that. My master's staying away a long time. They'll beat the fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. When we were kids, in my family, my parents were very strict. And they would only permit certain things at certain times. We weren't allowed to watch TV. We weren't allowed to do this and that and the other thing. And It wasn't so much that they were religious. They were just strict. And we had to obey certain things and we had a lot of rules in our family, but on Wednesday nights, mom and dad went bowling. <laughs> and at first they had babysitters whom we tormented. <laughs> but eventually my brother got old enough that he could be the babysitter, and boy, did we ever party down. <laughs> we, we, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, it, and the goal was, the goal was when dad and mom would leave, we would be perfect little angels. And they, they would leave, and it was like Lord of the Flies. <laughs> it, it, it was unbelievable. We would descend into absolute chaos, r running and tearing and playing tag in the dark, hide and go seek, and everything else. And the goal was <laughs> to get everything put back together nice and neat when mom and dad came home so they would never know the difference. And, th and this, this went on every Wednesday night. It was unbelievable. But, but one Wednesday night, one Wednesday night, which all of us have etched in our memories, <laughs> we, we were in rare form r r running through the house. I don't know. We were playing something. But somehow it always involved r running and screaming, and I don't know. And we were, we, we were running through the living room as fast as we could go and we looked up and my father was in the picture window of the living room with his hands on the glass looking in at this absolute madness going on in the house I don't remember much after that everything gets sort of dim <laughs> I have a feeling that for some, it'll be like that when Jesus comes. <laughs> they are just absolutely, you know, partying and carrying on. It's what Jesus said. They're just partying and carrying on and doing all of this stuff, not expecting Jesus, thinking that they, they're going to... How many of you understand? You're not going to get away with this. Jesus is coming. He is coming. He says... Be, Suppose that, that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. Now, Jesus uses this phrase a lot in different stories. 
So he's communicating the idea that he is, A, going away, B, he's going to be gone a while, a long time. And number three, you may be tempted to forget that, that he is returning. And he said, suppose that happens, and this wicked servant begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards, and the master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect. So you want to know what you and I ought to be doing while we await his return? Number one, we need to watch by faithfully sharing the word of God. Number two, faithfully loving and serving each other. And number three, we need to be faithfully walking in holiness and moral purity. Understanding, we're not talking about perfection here. What we are talking about is, is, is a heart that is given over wholly to God. And and, and walking in the light of God's word. That's what I'm talking about. Now Jesus continues on in chapter 25 and tells a second story which further defines which, what watch means. Now I read this a few weeks ago, but I'm just going to read it again and just draw out one or two points. Now we are in chapter 25, verse 1. At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. There's that idea. There's this, this long time in coming. They all became drowsy, fell asleep. At midnight, the cry, cry came out, Here's the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were already, who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came also, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Verse 13, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. The point here is not so much about the behavior, the condition, it's about watching and being prepared. A couple weeks ago, I focused an entire message on this parable. I don't want to repeat it all, except to point out that, that, that the virgins, these young maidens, were identical in every way, except one, they're all virgins, there's nothing to do with their morality. Number two, they were all drowsy and fell asleep. It's not about that. And they all woke up and trimmed their lamps. The difference is the wise had extra oil and the foolish were running out. You can't find your way in the darkness without a lamp and the lamp won't work without the oil. Now what is the oil? That's a picture of the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit operating. Throughout the scriptures, oil is commonly used as a picture of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah the prophet saw a vision of two olive trees standing on either side of a lampstand, and the oil from the olive trees is running into a bowl on the lampstand, and the oil causes the lamp to burn. And Zechariah asked, what is this? And the Lord answers, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. How many of you understand that you cannot do this Christian life in your own strength? If you try, you will burn out. You will burn out. This is not about us trying harder. It's not about us trying to be more morally correct. It's not about us trying to stay alert. It's not about any of that. What it is about is being filled with the Spirit of God and burning brightly for Him. That's what this is about. So to watch is to be filled with the Spirit and to burn brightly through the Spirit's power. That's what this is about. If you learn nothing else from this life, from this whole Christian experience, it ought to be this. You can't do this on your own. We can't do this on our own. 
If you can do this on your own, you're doing something wrong. What you're attempting is not Christianity. What God has called you and I to do is impossible without Him. But with Him, Paul says, through Him, I can, through Christ, I can do all things. Through Him who strengthens me. He, he, he wants you to attempt the impossible. And then He'll fill you with His Spirit and enable you to do it. You with me? So to watch, what, are, what should we be doing in this period of time while we're waiting for the king? Be filled with his spirit and burn brightly for him. When the lamp runs out of oil, guess what happens? The light eventually goes out, but not before it burns up the wick. When I get around some Christians, I can smell burning wick. They're not filled with the Spirit, but they're working hard for Jesus. They're serving Jesus just as hard as they know how. But they're like toast. They're almost burned up. And then you meet some Christians that it's, it, they're not even working at it. It's just as easy as it could be. It's just like rolling off a log. It's like nothing. And they just shine so brightly. And they're just so filled with God. It's, it's, the difference is not the person. The difference is our God. And he wants to fill us. He wants to anoint us. And he wants to cause us. How many of you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You can, you can, you can. So to watch is to be filled with the Spirit, burn brightly through the Spirit's power, and to keep filled, to stay filled. Don't be self-reliant. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be ye being filled. It's an ongoing thing. How many of you know we're like, we're like, like bags with holes? God pours it in and it just leaks out. That would be tragic, except that God is infinite, and he will re he'll fill you back up. The point is, we need to go to him every day. Say every day. Every, every day. day. Not just Sunday. Every day. Lord, fill me. I need, you to, I, need you, I need your power. I need your spirit. And he will fill you. Amen? Amen. Okay. So one last story, and then we're going to close. What should we be doing while we're waiting? Verse 13, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. There's that phrase again. And in Matthew 25, 14, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who calls his servants and entrusts his property to them. To the one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents and to another one talent according each according to his ability then he went on his journey see again there's this image this picture Jesus is letting us know he's letting his disciples know he is going to be gone for a while but he has entrusted something to us so the man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work gained five more so also the one with the two talents gained two more, but the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, again, Jesus is letting us know there's going to be a little while. He didn't tell us 2,000 years, but how many of you know that's a long time? The master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man that had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. Master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. Come, share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also come, came. Master, you've entrusted me with the two talents. See, I've gained two more. Master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things come and share your master's happiness notice they both get the same reward it wasn't how much money they made that wasn't the point the point is they were faithful they were faithful 
and they got the same reward. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man. He, I mean, wow. Immediately he is accusing the king, the master. It's his fault. It's your fault. I know you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you, but it's your fault. How many of you know if, you, if that's your attitude with God, things are not going to end well? That's right. When you start out your conversation with God like, it's your fault. <laughs> and I, I, I meet people like that. I don't like my life and it's your fault. Things are not going to go well. This conversation is not going anywhere. It's not going to end well. I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in, a gr in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, so you knew I harvested where I have not sown, gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would receive it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one that has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will be have an abundance. Who does, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me just say, this story is not about money. He uses money. But, but money is only a, uh, an illustration of, of something deeper. Keeping watch is about investing the life that God has entrusted to each of us. God has entrusted something to you. If you're alive, if you're breathing, you, you have life. You have something that God has entrusted to you. And when he talks about watch, it doesn't mean standing around in white robes, gazing into heaven. It means that we are deeply invested in behalf of the kingdom of God. God has given to each of us a measure of faith. To each of us have been given some natural abilities. To each of us has been given 168 hours a week. Now to some of us, God has given a great deal of money. To others, he's given a much smaller amount. Some of us, God has given physical strength and enormous energy. To others, he's given a lesser amount. To all of us, he offers eternal life through Jesus Christ. But to each of us, he gives spiritual gifts through Jesus, his son. The question is, what are you and I going to do with what God has given us, what, with what he has entrusted to us? The time, the energy, the abilities, the money, the life that God offers, that he, he has given to us, what are we doing with it? Watching for Christ's return involves investing what he has given us. Now, investment... Investing means putting it at risk. Putting it at risk. I used to have a tree business, and most people don't realize that <clears throat> every year that tree in your front yard or your backyard takes a tremendous risk. In the springtime, it, there's life in that tree. And in the springtime, that tree invests an awful lot of energy in putting leaves out. It just, the leaves just spring out. That tree isn't, you know, that tree isn't just, um, you know, like popping these leaves out because it has nothing better to do. It is investing. It, it takes a lot of energy to do that. And if you, if you like charted how much energy is in a tree, the, tr the tree is at its most energetic during the winter time, actually, because it has a lot of stored energy inside of it. And in the springtime, when it puts out all of its leaves, it's a tremendous amount of energy it invests, and, invests, and it, the tree drops to almost its lowest level when it's flush green. 
It has invested a lot of energy in putting out all of those leaves. But guess what happens? It just sits there and soaks it up in the sunshine. And it converts all of that sunshine through photosynthesis into energy. And it begins to store it up. So all summer long, it's, it's getting it back more and more. And by the end of the next year, by the end of summer, and the, by, by fall, it's ready to shed its leaves. It's got a lot more energy than it had even last year. All of it was an investment. Now, if something happens to that tree and it loses its leaves, if insects come and, you know, strip the tree of its, or something happens, the, the tree really, really suffers. And the following year, it's going to have a really tough time. It'll probably put out some more leaves, but it's greatly weakened. And if nothing happens, to, if something happens to that tree the following year, it's probably dead. It's gone. Okay, and so all I'm saying is this. Is, is that all of life is a risk. There's nothing guaranteed. You are given so much time, so much talent, so much energy, so much money, all, whatever. We are all given it. And what are you going to do with it? If you just hold on to it and don't risk it, don't invest it in anything, you're not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. This, this is not faith. Love is a life is a risk. You take a risk when you agree to marry a person. They could break your heart. You take a risk when you pour your life into a child. There's no guarantee and there's and you know, there's no refund. <laughs> Faith is a risk. You take a risk when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You take that step of faith. It's a risk putting your trust in Christ to save you and to keep you and to lead you. He doesn't force anyone to take that risk. You can reject him. And instead, you can trust yourself. You can bury that gift that he offers in the dirt and refuse to take the risk. Life is a risk. Love is a risk. Faith is a risk. The leadership of this church is asking you to risk your finances by investing in your church. The alternative to all of this is burying the life of God in the dirt. And if you do that, there are very serious consequences. The Lord calls them a very lazy, wicked servant who refused to risk the life that God offers. And he says, to everyone who has shall be given more. There are those who have invested largely into the kingdom of God and isn't it amazing how they always seem to abound and have more? Have you noticed that? Then there are those who are afraid. There are those who hold back. There are those who bury their gifts in the dirt. And isn't it amazing how they always seem to lack? They never have much at all. And there you have it, folks. Jesus is coming again. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? We have his word on it. I believe, I believe that we are about to see the greatest outpouring of revival that the world has ever seen just before Jesus comes. And I think there are some in this room that will, will see it. You will live to see it. I believe it. Maybe I will. I don't know. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be awesome? This is not a time to draw back. This is not a time to drop out. This is a time to dig in. Instead, we ought to do what Jesus tells us to do, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come on. Can't seem to move. There we go. We're going to watch for his return by, number one, faithfully sharing the word of God. Number two, faithfully loving and serving one another. Number three, faithfully walking in holiness and purity. Number four, by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And number five, by investing our lives into the kingdom of God. That's what it means to watch for his return. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, you are coming, I believe, for a triumphant church. Not a perfect church. But a church that is without spot or wrinkle because you have made us that way. 
Lord, you are coming back for a church that is sold out to you. On fire with your spirit. A church loving one another. Serving one another. A church that is sharing your word with this world. This lost world. Father, I pray that we will watch for your return. It will be that kind of church, that kind of people. And we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and worship God.
decided to follow Jesus today. I'd just like to know that. Maybe for all of us, let's watch for his coming. Let's be excited.